This is Max Ray, Sea Operations Commander of the Centurions. You're listening to Man and Machine Podcast Extreme, the Centurions Podcast. Power Extreme! Hey everyone, boys and girls, welcome to another episode of Man and Machine Podcast Extreme, the one and so far the only Centurions themed podcast with uh, me, Yuri, and my co-hosts, Mark. Hello. And Nick. Hello. Now, guys, uh, as we discussed before, the main mission of this podcast is to treat this niche cartoon and toy line, which is legendary to a lot of us, uh, but maybe not completely appreciated by the entire toy collector fandom and cartoon fandom we'd like to uh, reach out to the people who actually contributed into creating this absolute legend uh, of creative content whether that's toy designers like we did in the first season when we reached out to alton takiyasu who designed max ray all the all the accessories all the weapon systems all the figures and maybe we did focus more on the toy production side in the first season now with the second season we'd like to equally focus on the brilliant creative minds who put together the cartoon that actually made the characters the toys relatable to us so today it's a very special honor for us all three of us we're completely mind blown and amazed to welcome pat fraley the voice of max ray to the show welcome pat well, I'm so pleased to be here, Yuri and Mark and Nick. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Um, bear in mind, I, I have little uh, experience with toys because all we were doing was trying to make a really cool cartoon show. But it turns out we were selling toys. <laughs> I think that's that's a, a a fair a fair exchange, you know. To you know, just like in the the uh, Middle Ages, you you need the, the investors, the rich businessmen, to you know to provide funds for the artists. So you guys were the artists. You created the art, and I guess our parents funded the whole enterprise by buying the toys. <laughs> uh, so so it, actually, that segues into uh, a really interesting question, but not to put the cart in front of the horse. Uh, we would like to also introduce Pat for those of you who have lived under a rock and haven't heard of this man before. He's a voice acting legend, active since uh, he's been active for, uh, I would say, more than four decades now. Is that correct, Pat? I think so. Uh, I started in Australia and uh, it was about 45 years ago or more that's an incredible career uh, especially i would say during the time a time when uh, not every every second child wanted to get into voice acting because you know we were inspired by our heroes uh, we we will just mention a few examples of what you did because you know we're uh, uh, we would want to keep this podcast on time. There are several other episodes focusing from other podcasts focusing on some of your other work, some of your more uh, other legendary roles included uh, multiple roles from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles series. You were of course Ace, but not from the Centurions, but from GI Joe. Uh, which again was mind blowing to me because with Max you focus on a more a deeper voice. With Ace it was a, a young man's voice, and I'm like, this is the same period. This is the same guy. How is that possible? But apparently, you you know you're a professional. I think um, there's a funny. I know there's a funny story to how I was higher as Ace in GI Joe and lower in Max, and I'll get to that. Uh, we would definitely be interested in that. Uh, absolutely. One interesting tidbit, I since you probably don't follow these retro figure releases, it's interesting that uh, Hasbro actually is releasing a special crowdfunded project this year with, uh, with your figure, with Ace, as the pilot of a fighter craft that's like a really premium grade content uh, that they're releasing and they're also and another toy company also did a reboot for the uh centurions figure so actually two of your characters are coming out or have come out recently this year so uh it's it's interesting to to have that uh parallel uh but yes please could you uh explain that story of how you uh became part of 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 you know of those franchises 
Yes, well, I think you were referring to G.I. Joe, an ace yes. in G.I. Joe. Okay, so the story goes, and this has to do with Neil Ross, who I work with once in a while. Although we had very similar voices, he was a low tenor and I was a high baritone. So, G.I. Joe, I'm reading a script, I'm in the studio, ready to do it, and uh, I get to the latter part of the script and it says, How's hey? Somebody says, and somebody else says, he didn't come back. And I'm going, are you kidding me? They killed me and I didn't know? I was dead. And so um, I went up to uh, Seattle to do some work. And I got an audition for A's, but not in G.I. Joe, in Centurions. And I thought to myself, well, they killed off A's. And I was my, it was my own voice. I was about like that. Ace was about like that. And I thought, well, I might as well use Ace's voice. So I did uh, Power Extreme, uh, C Operations, you know, a a Ace, or Max. He was named Max, by the way. Well, back down in L.A., and I'd done G.I. Joe with Neil Ross. He played Shipwreck, I think. And he thought to himself, well, they killed off Ace. I'll use Pat's voice. So we both got cast. He and his role in mine um, a, as a, a mine is Max and he is an, uh, as an ace. And I got a call and we got cast. And boy, that's good. It was 65 episodes, which is about 75 grand back in the day. So it was good. I get a call from Michael Hack, who directed us. And he said, Pat, one of you guys, you or Neil has to go because you have the same voice. And I freaked, I thought, but quietly. And I said, let me, uh, yeah, I'll get back to you. So I call Neil and I said, Neil, you got to come to my office right now. We got to figure this out. We can't lose. So we get in there and we decide that Neil will go a little higher and I'll go down into the basement as low as I can go. You know, so I played Max like that and he played Ace like that. So we get to the studio, and uh, yeah, I go in and see Michael, and I knew him well socially, and I'd worked with him uh, before and, and after. And I said, hey, Michael, I'm in the basement. I can't go any lower than this. Well, poor Neil, for the rest of the 65 episodes, the, almost the only direction he got from Michael was higher. Higher. He was sort of like Don Knotts in outer space. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, so, could you share some uh, some thoughts about uh, if you remember how you prepared beyond the gold into the basement part uh, to characterize uh, Max? Because the only thing that visually I guess was there for you is maybe his like sketches or the figure uh, or photos, and he looked somewhat like uh, you know Th Tom Selleck from Magnum. Well, uh, I, this is the first time I've ever heard about Tom Selleck. We never were, to were told anything. I knew I was to be a hero. Although I had a mustache. Now, I've only, I've never played a hero with a mustache. I didn't then. Um, I actually uh, played maybe one other character in The Tick with a mustache, and he wasn't a hero. So I walked in, not seeing anything, only auditioning, and I was a hero, and that was it. I was low and a hero. So there wasn't a lot of prep to do the character. In fact, this is very funny. Michael Hack, who again, who directed us, would say a little more Art Fleming every so often. Now, Art Fleming was a game show host that hosted the show Jeopardy. And so, what Michael meant was, let's get let's get a little more taut and a little more concerned about what happened, because as you know, the Centurions is full of action sequences and action tough guy stuff. So he'd say a little more Art Fleming, and we just notch it up, and that was it. So Pat, my not understand that uh, when you went in to do the uh, voice of Max Ray, they didn't show you any any of you guys like artist renditions of what your characters are going to look like to help you know develop yeah. the you know character in your head. Okay, well me. Um design photos or xeroxes or whatever don't do much at all 
Now, Neil, he says, oh, I can't get a character until I know what they're dressed as. But frankly, um, I didn't do any research, and neither, I don't think, Neil did either, or Vince, or uh, anybody. We just knew that we were like, Ron Feinberg, Feinberg was playing what, Dr. Terror? Was that his name? Yes, yeah, that was, yeah he played by Ron Feinberg, yes. Yeah, he, which, by the way, was my manager. But Good. I'll get to that. Um, Ron <laughs> just knew he had a low voice. He's six eight, by the way, or was, and he, he's dead now. And um, he was to be mean. That was it. It was very simple, uh, as was the direction. I mean, we had twenty two and a half minutes to do, and in four hours, and we got it done. But that was it. Interesting. Very impressive. Pat, could you please go back uh, to when you were hired? Could you just explain the process or specifically if you remember anything beyond, you know, the the basement uh, voice story you told us about how you were selected or how if you auditioned? What was the process of casting for the Centurions from your perspective? Yuri, Yuri, the idea, there's a, there's a backstory to this about 65 episode show or 60 episode shows. And I'll have to go into it. To to give you a short answer, I simply auditioned. I knew uh, uh, Michael Hack. He brought in the people that were really in the saddle in 86. Now, let's go back to 83 to give you an overview really fast of where how cartoons went from Saturday morning to an after school event. Now, before uh, 83 and He-Man, who killed with the numbers going Monday through Friday, before that, it was like cherry picking. Uh, you'd go in, do a Scooby-Doo. You'd do about 13 of them. You were done. So we'd start at May and finish in June, and we were done for the whole year. They'd, they'd uh, replay and do this. But since He-Man, uh, created by, uh, uh, sin- or, uh, by Filmation, kill the numbers everyone jumped on doing these 65 episode shows which is monday through friday for a a season for a quarter okay uh we just thought oh great because it 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 made us we all made a lot of money neil ross and there are only 20 of us in town that could do everything including the guest shots we didn't have guests in those days we did everything three characters per show so here we are, uh, and we figure, oh, we're doing these wonderful shows like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, G.I. Joe, Centurions, you know. And it turns out that the people that were offering these shows for a well, the, well, each show costs about a couple hundred thousand dollars to do, they'd say to these. The, the Channel 11s and 13s, the syndicated programs, not ABC, NBC, or CBS. How would you like to have a cartoon show uh, every day, Monday through Friday, for free? And they went, yeah, sure. Okay, all we do is we'll trade you time. So they got time in allotments so they could go and sell that to commercials. The overview of this, and to this day, by the way, Ninja Turtles is still produced by a, a toy company. We were giving giving them twenty two and a half minute commercials, and the the salesman used to sell the extra time and make money that way. Long story, but that's why things changed to afternoon, like Tailspin, which was Monday through Friday. That's actually a fantastic story, and thank you for sharing these really interesting details on how the business worked back then, how these deals were made. Because that it, period in time in 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 TV uh, history was when this whole shift changed uh, from the old school ways of doing cartoons to this more action figure oriented and more the Saturday morning uh, layout that you you explained, uh, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. That's that's what happened, Yuri. 
so you said, Pat, that you were there were only uh, 20 of you in town who were able to do this. So they actually selected from those or that group or you were kind of like this, uh, you worked for the same agents or, or how, how were you moved from show to show and how did you end up in the Centurions? Well, uh, you know, uh, Ron Feinberg and I were both with Herb Tannen, the same agent. Michael Bell, he had CESD. Uh, you know, Bob Ridgely was a different agency. They, they all, but they were all no, They were all people that I knew that were really good, and most of them were very good at doing multiple roles. Now, as far as I was concerned, all I did was get an audition. I didn't know who else got an audition, but I got one and saw it, sent it in. Uh, but but in those days, you saw the usual suspects because there were so few of us that were so versatile, we usually came from Hanna-Barbera and, did, and learned there. We were very versatile, and that's what happened. Pat, I have a, a question for you. Now, you've already mentioned some of the other actors, uh, Neil Ross, Vince Edwards, uh, Michael Bell, Robert Ridgely, Robert Feinberg, and there were some other people who uh, played regular roles on Centurion, such as Diane Pershing, Ed Gilbert and Jennifer Darling. Um, okay, what was it like yeah. working with those people? And who have you worked with frequently and who have you worked with recently? Well, I, uh, recently, you know, with COVID-19, I haven't worked with anybody. I go in and alone to do a cartoon show. But uh, just to go down the list a bit, Ron Feinberg was 6'8". I had worked with him on Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. He met me and Brad Garrett, the comedian who played uh, Rob on Everyone Loves Raymond. He's six, eight and a half. So Ron took a liking to him, and somehow he took a liking to me, and he mentored or managed both of us. Now, in the cast was Bob Ridgely, the second time or as uh, things went along. Now, Bob mentored me. He was a strange guy. I was seated next to Vince Morrow. Now, no, Vince Edwards. Of Ben now, Casey ben, fame, yes. Vince, yes, was famous for doing Ben Casey. And before that, he was Mr. Universe. And he was a tough guy from Brooklyn. I was sitting next to him. He was like a, sitting next to a mafia guy, you know. And uh, <laughs> I, the, the Ben Casey used to open up this way with Dr. Zorba, played by uh, Jaffe. Sam Jaffe, uh, yeah. Sam Jaffe. Yeah, he'd go... He'd be writing on a chalkboard and say, man, woman, death, birth, infinity. And uh, when I sat down next to uh, Vince Edward, for some reason, I, I suppose I, I just wasn't thinking. I said, here's Vince, man, woman, death, birth, cartoon work, Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, everyone shrunk, and Vince turned to me and pointed to him and went, hey, you're funny. And fortunately, he rem reminded me over and over again I was a funny guy. Michael Bell I had worked with at Hanna-Barbera, and he was so skillful at doing versatility. He played an Apache in it. Um, Ed Gilbert, I later did Tailspin with, and he was a very good actor. Started off being the father in the Hardy Boys on a on the Disney uh, on Disney shows. It just if memory serves, you also did Brave Star with him too. Yes, I did with Ed Gilbert, which is another funny story. Um, we got in the studio. I was Brave Star, a hero, and I did very few heroes. I did comic villains a lot, and so we're all. There's a wonderful time where we all sit down. We know we're going to make seventy-five, one hundred grand uh, per show, and they're playing our auditions for us, and we love it. And they get to playing thirty thirty, which was a horse in Brave Star, and they play the audition track. And Peter Cullen is there in the booth, and he was, he said, "That's not my voice." Oh wait. He said, uh, no, wait, I'm sorry. Peter Cullen was in the booth listening to Ed Gilbert's audition. And he said afterward, that's not me. That's somebody else. And Peter Cullen had to walk out and Ed Gilbert came in and did 30-30. 
Wow. Oh, huh. Just unbelievable. For those uh, uh, of you guys out there who don't know who Peter Cullen is, he is the voice of Optimus Prime. So these are legends walking, you know, past each other that we're talking about. Yeah. And Pat, you also wor- you also worked with Peter Cullen on Filmation's Ghostbusters. Yes, and also Rainbow Bright. Mm-hmm. It turned out that Peter Cullen and I are Peter Cullen is a is a dark guy. I'm a really happy guy. So he, oftentimes he played kind of an evil, upset guy, and I played a stupid guy. And it was sort of paralleled <laughs> our our relationship. I was a little little Pollyanna, and Peter was a dark guy. That's hilarious. Uh, so, uh, by the way, as, as a footnote, w- did you have preferences, like when somebody was casting for a show, not to influence their decision, but were you sometimes happy to be paired with someone who you had a good dynamic with, or, or, or you were just professional, whatever, whoever comes in the booth, you're cool with them? Always loved working with Rob Paulson. Like uh, we've done hundreds of shows together because, you know, I just love being there around him. Uh, sure, uh, sometimes the cast was wonderful. Laser Tag Academy, I, lo- I sat next to Roscoe Lee Brown. That was also directed by uh, Michael Hack. Uh, but also, there's roles that I wanted. In other words, in The Tick, I was cast as The Tick. Uh, but I lost that because ben, the the creator, Ben Ingman, took a shot at it. And they came back to a guy named Townsend Coleman, who played Michelangelo uh, in um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But the good news was that he was so good, I realized I couldn't take. I, I wouldn't have been able to do come up to the ability that he had. So... There are few places where I wished I had a character that I didn't get cast and and a lot of wonderful experiences working with a cast member. It's interesting to hear. Awesome. So what was it like working with Diane Pershing who played Crystal Kane? Well, she's great, wonderful woman. She now lives in Washington, D.C. And she was another uh, uh, great ability at doing different characters. She was great. Also, Joan Darling, who played, uh, uh, I think, Irma. Amber, in, Doc Terry's daughter. No, Irma in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but in Am- but she played Amber. Yeah, and, and Joan, very fast. So in fact, she started in New York doing, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the title of the play, but she was uh, from theater. And she'd gone to theater school and very wonderful performer. Pat, a uh, qu- quick question since you mentioned that this is really fantastic because it really makes, paints us a really colorful, vivid picture of how voice acting, the voice acting subculture or profession was like in, uh, you know, at that time. Uh, by the time, you know, you really, you know, went into the, the show and you were at, you know, halfway through or you were through with most of the episodes, did you feel that there was like, just because you played three members of this, uh, this team, did you have like, uh, you know, a good chemistry within the show or with those characters with Neil and Vince? Well, you know, it, 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 well, I wouldn't call it chemistry. Neil was always seated in the back for all the shows. I was up front next to Vince. We heard each other and we knew how to act and interact and that was great but there's something i gotta tell you that's very funny that comes to mind i was not only cast as max but during those times because of law they had to have a one minute sequence that was like about you know don't throw away rubbish and don't do this and be be a good citizen right and that was always given to one person to do the whole one minute now um Michael Hack, I had a guest shot and Max, and he said, "Who raise your hand if you're light on your contract. In other words, you have two, not three characters. So I raised my hand. He goes, good, you're Dr. Wu. And I said, <laughs> Dr. Wu? Now, understand, this is back in the day where, you know, we played Apaches and Irishmen and even African Americans and everything, right? Mm-hmm. I said, Doctor, what is that Asian? I don't do Asian. He goes, You do now. 
So the only aging that I could do was uh, from Albert Printing in Los Feliz, where I lived. And Albert Printing, he probably Japanese, he was very loud. He had no volume control. Pad, your order ready. Right? <laughs> That's all I could do. And so I played Dr. Wu like that. Okay, you you have to go down underground and go on you jump up in New York City. It was horrible. And I've always been dyslexic, so it take, took me a long time. That's why uh, cartoon work was good for me, because there were short lines. But here I am, and they say, okay, we're going to do the Dr. Wu one minute. The entire cast would leave and go get coffee. A, because it would take me a long time, and because I did such a horrible Asian. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hilarious story, and it's funny that your memory is so vivid of 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 these these sessions. So it's it's uh, I, you know one of my fears that when before you know when prepping for this episode, Pat was that. Uh, we tried reaching out previously to writers of the episode, actually Mark did. And what they did was they said, oh, we just wrote like two episodes. I don't even remember the show existed. And of well, course, they, your role was more important, but your memory is so vivid about these well, things. Well, it's vivid about certain things that happened. Um, because really, it's like when I was growing up in the 60s, it's like looking back to the roaring 20s and flappers. It, just, it was a long time ago, but I... There are vivid memories that I have. And one I've got to share with you was uh, uh, Vince was not in a cast. He was not in the cast at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Why? He'd leave to get to the, the ponies of Santa Anita to bet because <laughs> he was a gambler. Wow. He was an inveterate gambler. In fact, it, during the time when he was passing, he said, don't do it. It's not that good to do. And it really affected his career. Now, Bob Ridgely, who was called Naughty Bob, he was a wonderful man. There's still producers I can't work for because uh, I kind of uh, admired him and did what he did. But he came in with a bag. Now, this is Neil Ross's story, but I don't know if, if Neil will be with you. So he came in with a paper bag and put it under his chair. And he said, where's Vince? And somebody said, well, he's gone. He's, you know, he's probably at the, at the ponies. And he went, oh, darn it. So he, we did the show. He left. Neil Ross, who was in the back, came up and looked and saw this bag, you know, underneath uh, Bob Ridge's chair. He pulled it out, and he knew it was for Vince. It was a gift. And he pulled it out and opened it. It was a bag of horse manure. <laughs> <laughs> so pat let me picture this so essentially uh, when we look at the cartoon the next time we could like whenever there's a fight scene that you know requires all the characters to get their weapon systems once you know uh we know that vince you know said you know crystal be me wild weasel we can imagine that after he ta recorded that he's just like stood up went out and went to the to, to the horse races and that's how like the the dubbing or the the voiceover days went for him well he just wouldn't show up for the whole thing or if it were a call at two o'clock in the afternoon that's when he didn't come if it were morning it was fine uh, the the funny part uh oh gosh i was thinking of something that was funny but it, it'll come to me oh one, once uh we were, we were very silly, by the way. That's, that's what brought it. When I would have a line, I had a wallet that had a zipper on it. And uh, by the way, Michael Hack loved all this goofing around. Didn't matter. We had plenty of time. And uh, I remember going, um, Amber, there's something I want to show you. It was a line. And I put the zipper on up to the mic and went Zip. <laughs> and that got a good laugh here's another good laugh michael bell was in the cast and he was a very uh, smart alec and uh we were goofing around doing silly stuff and so vince kind of got involved because he was kind of terse right so he got up and got on top of the chair dude to, to do his line and we all stopped and michael said Vince, you already got the part. Sit down. <laughs> Brilliant.
I got a question for you, Pat. It's, yeah. A lot of obviously we're all centering on fans here, and that also extends to the toy aspect of the of the pro, of the line. So my question is for you: Did Kenner at any point ever give any of the voice actors, producers, or anyone on the set any free samples of the figures and be like, Pat, here's your character, Max Ray, and hand you the fig? You know, no. The, they never gave you any. I often huh? got cells from different Bobby's World and stuff. I have some on my uh, my wall. In fact, I have that Ace from GI Joe, the pa- wonderful painting framed on the wall. But no, in fact, um, we never talked to anybody from Kenner. Can I interrupt you for one second? Ace painting. You mean like the card art? Well, it, it's it's probably about two feet by one, and it's a painting of Ace in a plane. And I didn't even sign it before I had it framed. It's it's beautiful. Oh, okay. But uh, I, I received some gifts like that, but not from Kenner. Never talked to Kenner. Did talk to Ruby and Spears and, and uh, Joe Ruby. And I worked for, uh, I think, Joe. Ken Spears and Joe Ruby. I worked doing Cowboys and Mumesa and a couple of things. They, they started off at Hanna-Barbera. And uh, I got to know... Um, a couple of them, but that's the only piece of people we ever talked to. Interesting. Um, part of my follow up to that question would be now you yourself, again, this is part of the toy aspect of the collection that we're asking this question for. Do you have a say collection of the characters that you played? Like you mentioned, you have an ace, you know, I mean, so what I'm basically asking is like, do, do you have a shelf maybe of, Max Ray, Ace, Brave Star, you know, all the characters that you voiced that received the toy. Do you have one in like your own personal collection where you can just look at it and be like, I voiced him, I did him, I did that character, or no? Nah. Sadly, no. You know, in fact, uh, I did 200 shows or something like that Tina of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've only seen six. Oh, wow. Um, because, wow. You know, it's sort of like a plumber having a collection of cisterns, you know, or floats, you know? <laughs> we, you know. I always said that when I get really old, and I am old, um, I can sit on and watch shows I did, hundreds of shows, until I die. But that's about it. Uh, I have memories of doing these shows, but no, like, souvenirs. Do you have any recollection of seeing these toys in, uh, you know, in uh, on on shop shelves or in stores or in or in newspaper ads where you see you looked at it and it's like, I'm that guy's voice, just or I'm that toy's voice, you know, anything like that? Well, I'll tell you what. It was '86, and my firstborn was '85, then '86, then '88, and then '90. They were kind of too little for centurions. And uh, but when they got older, I was doing I was helping Tim Allen doing the voice of Buzz Lightyear, Buzz Lightyear to infinity and residuals. Right. (laughs) Because he was so very busy and they used to go to KB Toys and I did uh, many of the characters, but he did the original uh, toy where you pushed a button and you heard to infinity and beyond. Right. Well, they go down the row and push and go, the dad, Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen, dad. They could tell. Really? But they never really uh, took an interest because they grew up around Ed Asner, uh, Rob Paulson, Brad Garrett. They thought they all were clever. They didn't even know they were actors. And so I, I, I didn't bring that home. They just thought I made money by doing funny voices in the bunkhouse, you know? Yeah, that's that's super funny. You know, I'm I'm also from '86, so I I experienced the cartoon when I was when they were you know uh, shown as reruns in Europe in like the '90s. So I totally understand you know the situation with your kids. Um, and actually, you know, uh, of course, you know it was work for you, so we understand that. But 
uh, when you when you look at the cartoon, uh, did you enjoy any part of the themes? Like, you know, what was your perspective on the show? Uh, did you know? Uh, did you guys, as voice actors, think it's oh, it's just, just a ch- silly children's show? Uh, you know, it's children's fantasy, or did you appreciate the science fiction themes in it? Um, what were your thoughts? Well, I'll tell you what. For the lion's share of shows, we'd get. Uh, the script the day before and we'd you know read through it and then when we got to the recording session there were only the lines that we had and Centurions was a unique show because there was so much action and so few lines and so to answer your question we didn't get the science fiction we didn't get that they put stuff on us after we said power extreme we would go power extreme you know three of us together and we didn't know what they did. We just did the lines. Uh, oh, yeah, once in a while there was a chuckle or someone was in labor and trying to get something lifted up. And we knew that from the script. Oh, we were given that note by Michael Hack, the director. But no, we didn't know what was going on. We just liked the lines and did the lines, and that was it. Oh, so you weren't shown the animation or pieces of the animation or any drafts, just a, you got the script and it was no visuals, just go for it? Yeah, and later, maybe the year later, we'd see, you know, a little piece of something they, they uh, animated. In those days, they were doing them in Singapore, North Korea, Japan, Australia. They were doing them away from L.A., with the exception of Filmation, who did everything in the States, in the same building where we recorded. Highly unusual. Wow, interesting. Yeah, um, well, I imagine they just wanted to keep the uh, assembly line going as quickly as possible. But anyway, Pat, um, uh, even That's given right. The- By the way, <laughs> you, it's a good point. It was like a... Uh, it w- we didn't understand that we were selling toys. In Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, we thought, oh, we have a, a wonderful show, and kids love it. Well, they love the toys because they'd sit there and play with the toys and watch the show. Funny, funny. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. That, that, well, I, I, I imagine that's true for any of the shows you did. Um, but um, so I just wanted to ask, even given that, that very uh, quick process, are there any episodes or specific scenes from Centurions uh, that stand out in your memory, or any of your shows for that matter? Um, Well, for Centurions, I would say no. I remember going in countless times and doing Max Ray and, you know, having fun and doing it. In some shows, there are, you know, wonderful moments in my life. In fact, I have to share one of them with Bobby's World. Now, I was playing a mall guard, and Rob Paulson got cast as the same character, but higher. So we were the same guy, Meeker and Smurd. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, or, but Meeker was fat and Smurd was skinny and little. So we would do our lines, and the next year, we realized they got the characters wrong because the big guy had the little voice and the little guy had the big voice. Huh. <laughs> yeah, so they, they got the entire thing wrong. But here's a golden moment for anything you ever have watched or know about. Um, Rob Pauls and I worked so well and together, and we did Teenage Again, Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Bobby's World. Now, Bobby's World, we got to the point where we had to ad-lib our entire parts because they put us in every show. We were tooth fairies. We were mall guards. We were this and that. And the, right, the writers, Jim Fisher uh, and the other fellow, uh, they said, well, where's the part for uh, Meeker and Spur? And they go, why write it? They'll ad-lib anyway. So we got to, even after that, we got to the part where we'd write each other's ad libs. <laughs> so when they figured out once, Jenny McSwing was directing, and said, okay, you guys have to switch roles because they messed up the animation. So I had a piece of, I ripped off some ad libs for Rob, 
which I wrote for me, and passed it down. Tino and Sano was there, uh, all these actors. And we got to Frank Walker, and the person next to Frank said, oh, Frank, here's Rob's ad libs. Now, where else would you give someone else their ad libs? And Frank Welker was, laughed to tears. <laughs> and it's a golden moment of the freedom that we had doing voices. Wow, that's that's crazy. Um, Pat, I was wondering, since you were telling all these funny stories and we are we think it's hilarious and it's super funny, uh, that you you do remember the creative process, you know, the production when you did the uh, the episodes, even though you didn't see any visuals and you know you only read parts of the story that were relevant to your scenes. Uh, all in all, uh, does does the show hold a special place for you in your heart, like in, in even in a small way, or how do you uh, compare to all the thousands of voices or all the the episodes that you did for other cartoons or other shows uh how do you feel about centurions is it somewhat special to you or is it one of the more memorable ones how do you feel about it well i'll tell you what actors do bad movies because it's wonderful to work on anything you love it and certainly in animation where it's it's right playing everyone gets right even if they get even the luminaries got rate maybe they get paid out first but they still get rate so i don't hold one show i'll give an exception uh, over another i loved them all in fact i've done some of the best and worst the <laughs> best i think is the tick it was the funniest show i ever did i've seen all the episodes maybe about 13 or so and the worst was little clowns of happy town <laughs> just horrible. But when you're in the saddle, you don't have time to judge it or review. You just do the best you can. If it's good, you try not to get in the way of the funny lines that are written. When it's bad, you try to make them better. But in the tick, it was particularly uh, unique working with Mickey Dolans and Townsend Coleman and all the the usual suspects. Eddie Gilbert was in there too. Or Eddie Gibson. No, Gilbert. I, I made a, a funny, Neil and I wrote something funny about Eddie Gibson, Eddie Gravy Gibson. But Eddie Gilbert, Ed Gilbert uh, was in the tick. And I, I really hold that as a special thing after seeing stuff much later. Although I knew it was good when we did it. But uh, Centurions doesn't hold a, a soft spot in my heart. Um, the, my whole career is a soft spot. Fantastic. Well, um, th that's a good way to look at it because, um, I mean, I know that for you it was just a job. Um, I mean, you were working on several other shows that particular year, and not to mention your whole career. But, but yeah, I'm just glad that you're willing to spend some time talking with us about the show. Um, anyway, oh, yeah. Then, but by the way, by the way, Neil Ross once. Uh, when we first started out and we were doing uh, the Smurfs and this show in 65 episodes, he confided to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have nine shows. I mean, we're talking about 65 episode shows. And he had to keep a cassette player so he could remember what he did. And so wow. we were very uh, – it was the golden age of animation, if not SAG. Because we made so much money and we worked so much. But uh, going back to actors will do anything. I don't know. I can't remember turning down anything. Why? Because they were all so squeaky clean. And so there was no reason, obvious reason, why you wouldn't do a show because it was horror or it had bad language or nudity. No, there was none of that. So we just took everything. Uh, if I may, what did you guys get per episode, salary-wise? I'm thinking, uh, with the exception of filmation, we got about 500 bucks at that time a pop, plus 10% above. Because when you work, uh, yeah, we, so the agent took money above, not from. But uh, filmation was different because they paid the residuals out front. We we're all union players. So they paid twelve hundred a show. So if you got a sixty-five episode show, you knew you'd make a hundred grand. Hmm. Wow. 
Uh, well, well, you'd make about seventy-five grand. Pat, sorry, that, that was the eighties pay, though, right? Like in, yeah. in that time period, so I was infl- you know. Well, wow. I'll tell you what. The funny part was once I came home with my first contract. It was a Scooby Doo Ghost Hollywood, which Variety uh, reviewed it. Scooby Doo Doo Doo. It was <laughs> so bad, you know. <laughs> I came home proud, and I showed Renee, my wife, uh, my contract, which was about three hundred and I don't know fifty bucks plus ten. And she looked at the contract and took it in her hands and goes, "Wow, that's two and a half pairs of shoes." <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of wow. gives, you, gives you the overview of what my kids and my wife thought of what I did. You know, now that I teach, I, one of my kids said to me, hey, Dad, do you sell any your crap? <laughs> you know, <laughs> they just don't have any. Uh, if you're looking for respect, don't come to my house, you know. <laughs> wow. That's, that, that's a shame to hear that, man. That really is. Because with your job, I have the ultimate respect for it. I'm sure Mark and Yuri and many of our followers would agree. We have a the ultimate respect in your job. Well, bless you're, you're you. not I, even getting that respect at home. Was, I'm well, sorry. Bless, it's kind of yes, but you know what? It turned out to be a good thing. It kept me leveled. Here I am working all the time doing, you know, animation and, um, and, and just kept me grounded. Just I'm a regular guy. My mom, by the way, told me I was special all my life. I got a career out of it, but she was wrong. I'm just a guy. Wow. Have you ever told your kids, you know, whenever they were, they were like, you know, they had an attitude that, you know, well, uh, the tick put you through college or, you know, Max <laughs> Ray or Scooby-Doo put you through college or, you know, you should be more respectful of your cartoons. Did you ever like joke with them? Uh, no, but I remember one thing was very funny. My, uh, um, my first son, uh, I, uh, he died, uh, oh, and so my sorry. second son became the eldest, which is very sorry, hard. Uh, yeah, me too. And uh, Harrison, second born, once, and I'm talking 20 years ago, when I was working a lot, you know, he, but not as much as I was working, because I was working like two shows a day. I was working, you know, eight hour, 10 hour days. He was mad at me and said, you voiceover has been, I almost kicked him. <laughs> But but uh, no, I never really pulled that about you going to a private school in Virginia because of Dinky the Duck. You know, I never did. <laughs> wow. You did mention because there are so many things to, you know, that that kind of summon new questions and they inspire us to come up with new questions we, we haven't initially thought of. You did mention that uh, I you said your agent was Ron Feinberg, uh, correct? No, my manager no. was Ron your manager. Feinberg, which is a funny story. Uh, but our agent, similar, was Herb Tannen, who was really the top notch, one of the top notch agents in L.A. But the funny part was, I asked her or uh, Ron Feinberg. I went to uh, Muslim Franks and sat down at a meal. And I said, "I want you to cover me with my career and get me involved in education." And he said, "Okay, kid. First, you got to get your teeth fixed. My lower teeth were kind of uh, splayed out a little bit." And so I said, "Okay, I'll, I'll get hold of you." Well. I went and had one pulled, and they completely, perfectly, with braces, pulled it together. So they were perfect. Two weeks later, I got to I got together with Ron at Moos and Franks, and I said, "Look," I showed him my teeth, and he turned white, and he said, "That's how I get get rid of men." I told women to lose ten pounds, and then <laughs> he took me on. Wow. <laughs> That's insane. Uh, well, you, apparently you, you did pass his test. So uh, Yeah, that's apparently. Funny. Yeah. 
So Ron, you, you said you mentioned something. But so Ron Feinberg was your manager. Yes. So you were actually working side by side with your manager, and you did say that because you were you were uh, considered a Ron Feinberg guy by some, that it it caused some uh, tension, or some shows had issues with it, or some people remember that. Could you elaborate on what you mentioned with regards to him? Well, he he took a liking to me, and he took a liking to my work. And so there was never any problem with him. And he, by the way, he was a character actor and we saw him in Hawaii Five O and stuff. And a lot of plays, he went to Stanford, but he played because he looked weird and a bent nose and he was tall. He played uh, people of low intelligence or uh, villains. But uh, I loved his work too. So he was a very good actor. And so, no, I never had a problem with him as a, my manager uh, or with anybody, really. Okay, that that's really cool, Pat. Um, I had another question for you. Um, what was the voiceover process like uh, uh, on Century Angel or you know, any other show? Did you re- How did you receive the scripts, and did you meet for table reads? Well, um some shows early on, like at Hanna Barbera, we had a table read and went in. As I mentioned, the day before, usually it was brought to my door by SAG ruling to give me the script. So I was able to thumb it because when I got there, I got a recording script, which was different than a real script. It only had a lot, excuse me, it only had lines. And so we'd come in and we'd mark the cues, which is another funny story. Uh, and, uh, no, we'd mark our lines, right? Highlight them. I got to tell a funny story here. Chuck Bloor, who was the really most decorated, uh, guy in history of, uh, voiceover and was a writer. Um, I worked for him a great deal. And, uh, once he walked by me and I was highlighting my lines and he looked down and said, get out. You'd be better off highlighting your cues the way you work. <laughs> in other words, I'd come in late. Wow. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so sometimes, to go back to this, uh, we did have a table read. Uh, G.I. Joe, some of the other shows. Some we didn't. We just came in, and we got and literally with Jeannie McSwain in Bobby's World. I'd come in, and we'd start recording. And uh, get to my part, and she go, she go, Friday, what do you got? Well, I'd write three things down on the script characters, and I'd go, well, I was thinking about, no, 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 what's next? Well, I was thinking about, no, no, what's next? And I said, well, I don't want to tell you because it's so stupid. And she'd go, no, no, let me hear it. That was the one she'd choose. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Talk about, uh, you know, um, interesting method of operation. Well, well you, we were like uh, stunt people. Like you come in and they go, okay, you're going to uh, do a triple somersault and jump through a candy glass window. Okay, rolling. You know, we, we had to be prepared. And so it was better management of characters, changing a dial. Like uh, Michael Bell, who was in Centurion, you should say, we're sort of like Mr. Potato Head. We take off a nose, put a different one on, and ears. It, we managed what we did. And when I first came to work at Hanna Barbera in 1979, I was so awed by the abilities of Dawes Butler, Don Messick, uh, these wonderful Joni Gerber, uh, June Ferre. I was so in awe. But after a couple months, I realized, oh, I see. That's the same character with a different dialect. So they man- we managed better than created. Oh yeah, we had to create, but we came in with a parcel of stuff. It's interesting that you you, you mentioned how how you worked back then, and uh, seeing you know the uh, voiceover landscape now. There are far more animated shows. You know, with the uh, arrival of Japanese animation, you know, in large volumes to the U.S. I think more and more people were involved. Now that you can do it from the comfort of your own home, a lot of new people also joined, uh, and there are panels at conventions about how to be. You 
you know, how to become a voiceover artist. Uh, how would you compare your life and essentially the voiceover business from your specific perspective, the goods, the bad, you know, uh, from like the 80s all the way through the 90s to today? Like, you know, just just in a nutshell, what's your the, do, do you look at those times uh, as like the good old days or do you look at these new times as like hey new opportunities new technology what how did your how do you feel about the different eras you know since the 80s about voiceover well um it's a big plus for people doing narration uh doing uh, e-learning to uh, you know, when they're alone right or com- even commercials because rarely do you work with somebody in a commercial or and certainly video games you're always alone because it, it's a puzzle to put it together but uh, back in the day and up until COVID-19 animation was always ensemble the whole cast or mainly most of the cast were there why because of the acting the pinch and ouch you get somebody initiated, you know, nice hair. And you have to go, what are you getting at? Well, when you hear it, it's better for the performer to react to that. What we have to do is we have to pretend when we're in dialogue, when we're alone, that someone very good has given you a line and you react. So it's not as good. It's not, certainly not as fast and not as fun. It's fun to be in a room with 20 other actors or seven or 12. I got to tell a funny story about working on Galaxy High with David Landers. David Landers was squiggy. You know, he talked like this. <laughs> okay. Well, Howard Morris was directing the cast, and he said, I'll make you a deal. If everybody shows up all the time so there's nobody that has to be dummied in or whatever, I'll pay everybody. So the whole cast was whole, all there, and I was down the way from David uh, in front of my own mic. Well, when Howard, who was, swore like a sailor, right? I can't uh, repeat some of his lines, but <laughs> he would give David Lander his uh, notes, Landers, and uh, I would sneak on the ground. The whole cast would watch me, and I'd get up. Now, Howard's short. He couldn't see us, and they only put up the 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 microphone for the person who, who was getting the notes. So here's David getting notes, and Howard's going, "Okay, do this, and the second part, the, the, don't be so loud, and do this and that." And uh, knowing their face, uh, I would sneak my head up after Howard was done, and I go, "Shut up, you little Jew!" <laughs> and he would go nuts. He would go, who the hell are you talking? And David, bless his heart, would never bust me. He'd go, hey, I used to be a co-star, you know. <laughs> but I said it twice, and it was, they. I don't think Howard ever knew. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Howard Morris, there's another legend for you. Uh, but anyway, uh, Pat, um, yeah, we're, we're going to be wrapping up not too, not too long from now. But, okay, uh, Centurions had uh, a little science lesson at the end of each episode. And I know that, that uh, Max did some of those. Um, do you have any comments on doing those scenes? Uh, uh, what kind of feeds are they? The science lessons at the oh, end, so, uh, you know, yes, the PSAs. Well, the, yes, yes, the one-minute things. Well, as I mentioned, Dr. Wu. I was the guy that did Dr. Wu. When I did Max doing one, and I don't recall doing one, probably was a lot easier, and they probably didn't leave the room. In fact, uh, a lot of us would go get coffee when they would do the one-minute PSAs because it took about three or four minutes to do it. But i got to tell you one thing. In order to keep a show buoyed, any show, really, there has to be fun. You can't sit in a chair and then say, it's your turn, okay, go. No, you have to be there, certainly an ensemble. Everyone has to be present and going. And um, that's another thing that I miss. But the important part was we fooled around a lot. And I got on this when I saw... Uh, Danny Dark doing Superman and Hanna-Barbera. <clears throat> and he ad some funny line, obviously, usually very rude, right? And the cast would, 
be hilarious. That's what's great about Rob Paulson. He always makes the cast buoyed. And because you're in there four hours, you know, so you want to have some fun. And we did have fun. So, Pat, when you essentially or, you know, figuratively walked off, you know, out of the studio building, the the last day you recorded anything from the Centurions, probably around 84, 85, 85, I guess, uh, you did you feel like, ah, oh, this was fun? I always thought it was fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, there I can't recall shows that were a pain in the neck. I do recall one show, I got to tell you. David Hall is a wonderful actor, and he had been in a wreck previous to me coming there, and he had uh, lost both his legs. Okay, so he w- had a application on one, and he was just getting over the grafting and the surgery on that. And we went in and did a show, and I can't remember what it was. I think it was The Littles. And uh, David was sitting next to me, a very pleasant, sweet guy. And when we got into about the 10th hour and he'd split his Pergadan with me, right? And um, he turned to me and said, you know, Pat, when I started this show, I had legs. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Wow. wow. One of the funniest stories I've ever heard. And I don't think I've ever shared it. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. I mean, I mean, you guys, I love how you can say outrageous things to each other and everyone knows that, you know, there's nothing offensive meant by it. No, no. In fact, uh, Rob, I'm sorry to Rob used to do this. He'd look at me and I'd put two Altoids in my front lip like their teeth. And he'd go, you know, Pat, if it's funny once, it's funny a hundred (laughs) times. But what he would do a lot of times is he'd take a full pencil And he'd say to me, Pat, do that, do your line again. And I'd do my line, and he would snap the pencil in half as if it's so bad. (laughs) It's a visual, but there was a lot of stuff we did to each other. Uh, And we, we, if you got to laugh, you got to laugh. Indeed. Pat, you're really not helping, you're not helping making your career less admirable and less you know less desirable for well, kids because it seems like it a blast was, and it for like is 40 years. and uh, i i have to admit that uh, although it, it, it i know we're running out of time but it reminds me of bob dylan's uh, song like a rolling stone once upon a time through above my dime didn't you you know that song oh he yeah great dead, song never compromise well mm-hmm. i always thought oh what a wonderful piece well he got the song from reading a little poetry. He'd just broken up with a girlfriend. And he remembered that the demo was done like um, like a Kurt Vile song by Anthony Newley with bongos <gasps> and, a, and bass. So it was like, once upon a time, throw a bomb. Didn't you? You used to never compromise with the mystery trend. You over your rise, you know? <laughs> And so he, he was inspired by those three things and wrote this brilliant creative song. And it always reminds me that the creative process is a lot simpler. Many people have careers, in, in, certainly in Centurions, by doing impressions. But they don't do them too, too well, so no one catches you. That's fine. Um, anyway, speaking of voices, Pat, um, yeah, um, now we've mentioned uh, Max Ray and Dr. Wu. Um, if I remember correctly, you played a third recurring, recurring character on the show, uh, Mako, Doc Terror's um, you know, fish cyborg. And I rewatched a couple of episodes in which he appeared, and um, wow, that character has a really weird voice. I wonder if that took a toll well, on you. Yeah. That was, uh, some characters have taken a toll on me. I threw my back out twice doing crying because he had to walk backwards and flipped around, right? And so I'd go on vacation and come back and go, well, no, oh, oh, my neck, you know. But the character you're referring to was not me. It was Neil Ross. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. The reason I know is because he does his quack a little, 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 little sound as he talks he can do that and uh, that's what he did 
Okay, well, I hope I can ask him about it sometime. Yeah, anyway, I just want to say, Pat, I mean, if you want to wrap this up now, um, I would really like to ask uh, about your uh, your attempt to, um, you know, um, pass your knowledge on to the next generation by doing your voice acting course. Well, I teach a lot more than I did. Why? Because of COVID-19, I can't go in a studio. They're all closed. And also, I'm old. You know, I'm 73 years old. When they want a 50-year-old, they get a 40-year-old. So uh, I teach more. I always had a passion for performing and teaching. I was doing it at four years old, and somewhere along the line, about 40 years ago, they started paying me. And at my site, patfraley.com, I have on the menu free lessons, and they're free, and there's a gaggle of them. Also, I teach home study courses. I'm not a coach. I'm a teacher, but a good teacher is a coach. And so I take MP3s, and I have home study courses and private session sets. And in my contacts is my personal email and my personal phone number. It's faster if they cont- if p- people contact me with questions on email. And I'll be available until I go to heaven. Then I won't be. That's amazing. We're uh, Pat. We're super grateful for your time. This has been a fantastic episode. I'm I'm very honest when I don't like something, and I'm very honest when I love something. And I think I agree with all all two of the other guys, Mark uh, and Nick, when I say this. This has been a fantastic experience. Um, I I would say. Do you have any other maybe uh, other memories or anything that we haven't asked about regarding this the show? How it was produced, what it meant to you, or the legacy of that. That this little show that was on air well, for like I, I gotta seasons. tell you, um, I've given you an overview, and and as you can tell, I I can't help but go to another show. It's all one show to me, you know. It's all a myriad of different performances on cartoons. Um, Centurions is uh, right there in the mix of fond memories, and I've given you some about. Uh, Michael Hack, working with him, working with Bob Ridgely, Neil Ross, Vince Edwards, Ed Gilbert, who I adored, you know, um, and that's sort of the shower of all my days, man. And so um, forgive me if I've gone off track off Centurions. I, I love no, Centurions, I, but I love GHO. You know, that was a grueling thing. It was not grueling doing Centurions. It was real simple. We show up, we had cough, we went, we, we either rehearsed or we went in the studio. I don't think we rehearsed. And we were all seated in the same places all the time. And so we, I was next to Vince the whole time. And, uh, w- and we recorded, and Mike was loose. He would not bust us, whereas like some producers would, tell us to be quiet and stuff like that and shut up or this or that. And we just sort of laughed it off, but we didn't get that from Michael. And so it was a, a joy to, uh, to record. And I honestly, the only shows I've seen that I recall have been of recent on YouTube. And I went, Oh, look, a lot of action. And that was one of the most action-packed shows, <laughs> even more than G.I. Joe. But to, to kind of uh, remind our uh, listeners, you did have to have a solid foundation. I know we haven't talked about, you know, your early days because I think you discussed that in other podcasts. We just wanted to focus, you know, with this, this uh, one hour that we had for on the Centurions. Uh, I hope you didn't mind that. But just to remind people, you did have, you know, uh, experience acting experience before and you did did study the craft so it's just something just like you walk in uh you know one day to the studio and here like and, and we're like hey guys i i just want to do voiceovers like there was it was fun and fun and games and you really enjoyed it but you did have a foundation for that i did thank you for, for asking profession. that i started uh you know studying acting in high school then in college and then went to cornell and got an mfa in acting i at that time a, a single white, reasonably good-looking guy went to theater. There were no improv classes or comedy classes. I just wanted to be a performer. So I went to Australia and emigrated to do more Shakespeare because I was told I, need, I was light on Shakespeare. Well, I was a failed theater actor. 
oh, French fart, I saw it was great. But when Chekhov came along, the pilot light went on, went out. So I, I realized they needed really vibrant, big, evocative characters for uh, uh, cartoons. And that's why I went toward cartoons. And when I came back to the States, I went there. But I always like to say that I cheated. I acted. <laughs> and I'll give you a fast example. I'll give you a fast example. If I ask wow. you to do a three hundred pound Scottish lisp, a Scottish dialect with a lisp, and so I'm a big duck. Well, you're you're uh, attracted by the frosting of the cake. It's all those choices you make to realize the author's intent and the pictures. So he's this big. Well, if I scrape all that off, first of all, I go, don't you tell me what to do, Mark. Right? <laughs> I scrape it all off and go, don't you tell me what to do, Mark. I'm playing an action. I'm Pat Fraley telling Mark, and my objective is to diminish you. That's where I'm, that's how, uh, I always say, I got attention by doing colorful stuff. I got hired by acting. Now I, I simply don't understand why Max wasn't, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Australian with an Australian accent. Like, how are you doing? I never did an Australian dialect in Australia. I only did it later because they're so picky. Yeah, uh, Max actually was Australian in the you know, early oh. drafts of the show. But anyway. Pat, I mean, you know, this has been a, a wonderful experience for us. You know, this is Mark speaking, and we hope it's been a, a wonderful experience for you, too. I mean, we hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane, and, um, you know, uh, we appreciate your giving us uh, so much of your time and talking about so much of your career. Well, I'm grateful to you for having me on, man. Yuri, Mark, Nick, thanks so much, and really wonderful questions, and th and. As everyone has in common who has worked with me or been taught by me or I've been taught by them, the one thing you have in common is you put up with me. Absolutely. You know, you basically, I think the reason why our generation, although, you know, uh, three of us guys are different ages, but our generation looks up to you guys like the voice actors is because that foundation of you know do a, be a good person do good things a lot of that comes from of course our parents and our upbringing but it also comes from the cartoons that you know taught us especially in the 80s i think that was the pinnacle of this this kind of writing and this kind of storyline uh creation where it really taught us to be a good person you know help those less fortunate and just to to have the moral standards you know and just have a backbone and be a a good person and i think because you guys were the ones who basically channeled those thoughts and and delivered you were the flesh and blood of those drawn figures i think that's why we still are emotionally are are, are so amazed by uh you know by by the work that you did and that you really felt like so so genuine that you know that what, what you did to those characters to bring them them alive well i gotta tell you uh uh i was happy and joyful the whole time But I got to tell you about getting along with people. I had a real problem with Michael Bell and Charlie Adler, two wonderful, uh, talented performers. So, so what did I do? Oh, and Stu Rose. Really? So what did I do? I prayed. And to this day, Michael Bell and especially Charlie Adler, and Stu's gone, are really dear to me. And we're so close. It was an answer to prayer. But I'll tell you one funny story before, as I leave. Stu Rosen, who directed a lot of stuff, and he's the only director to fall asleep while he was directing, by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, sounds like my worst actor. I never got along with him. A lot of people <laughs> didn't. He chased one actor with a broom. You know, it, it was tough. So I said to Renee, my wife, I said, what do I do with Stu? I got to go in and work for him. And she said, well, bring him something. So I was hand tooling leather at the time, and I brought out a fair frame. I uh, bowed it and brought it in. And I said, here, Stu, this is for you. And the engineer uh, was behind me. And he looked at it and looked at me and said, why? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> that's, that's very funny. Um, 
Pat, we are really grateful uh, for your yeah. time. Maybe one final, final question. If if any of us or if our friends look at uh, their shelves and look at the Max Ray figure and they want to, you know, when there's nobody else around, they want to pretend to be Max Ray when they hold the figure. Could you give us like a 30 second crash course on how to be well, Max Ray? What you Ray? do is you start off as you are. You go as low as you can. And you really take what you do seriously. Be serious and low. And that was, that's it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Pat, thank you so much for your time, guys. Thank you for uh, the great questions that you helped uh, come up with. Uh, Pat, we wish you a long life and many, many more years of, uh, of a successful career. Uh, we also wish, you know, uh, fingers crossed that the show comes back. You know, if Warner Brothers ever thinks of rebooting the show, we we hope they will think of you as the iconic Max Ray. Thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, thanks you, Yuri, Mark, Nick. Thanks, and thanks for your illuminating questions. Absolutely. Again, thank you. And if you wouldn't mind, just one final time, echoing the uh, the catchphrase of the show. Power Extreme! Extreme.